This episode brought to you by Stamps.com. Why go to the store to get stamps when you can have them printed right at home for your convenience? Also brought to you by Chime, the award-winning app and debit card that can save you money today. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the outcast, the creepy and depraved, the bizarre creations not meant for the normal world. Embrace the twisted weirdness of Freak Show Cinema! We've all seen that movie that was so popular every film for a while tries to copy it. After the MCU was a hit, suddenly cinematic verses were everywhere. After Star Wars, there were a ton of clones, some better than the real clones. And believe it or not, there was a time when every movie was trying to be Beetlejuice. Granted, some of these films were stories before this movie came out, but it's clear Beetlejuice had an influence on their productions. They're supernatural comedies with a dark edge involving monsters or ghosts and usually have a comedic talent who's not the main character, but often steals the show with an over-the-top performance. Surprisingly, though, Beetlejuice is tougher to clarify than that. Yes, the story seems straightforward. A couple dies and becomes ghosts in their own house while new residents move in and they hire an exorcist for the living to try and get rid of them. But the way the film is executed presents a lot of contradictions that, frankly, shouldn't work. The world is very detailed, except when it's very vague. It follows a lot of its rules, except when it doesn't. The effects are mind-blowing, except when they're cheap. It has childlike imagery, but is definitely not for kids. Sometimes the dumbest characters are smart and the smartest characters are dumb. And it's a film about death, depression, and surviving after you fail to survive, yet it's also kind of about nothing. Even the name is a contradiction. He's the title character, yet he's the main player that arguably gets the least amount of screen time. Heck, the film couldn't even agree how to spell his name. In most movies, these would be problems, but with the energetic and bizarre direction of Tim Burton, who only directed one film prior, they helped this movie stand as one of a kind. Nowadays, you will look back on this and immediately recognize Burton's style, but back then, even he wasn't entirely familiar with this style yet. Pee-wee's Big Adventure has elements of his unique look, but it's not swimming in it like this film is. Yes, he clearly combines a lot of styles that have come before him, but the way he combines them makes for a look that we all identify with his name. It was the first time in a motion picture he gave us the visuals we would always associate with him, but ironically the film had a lot of freedom yet a ton of pressure at the same time. The studio didn't fully understand what this was or what it was going to be. So while it did have a decent budget of 15 million, it wasn't on par with what other supernatural comedies had back then. Like Ghostbusters had double that. Because of this, the studio would panic and make recommendations that didn't really follow the film's tone. Instead of singing Deo at the dinner table dance, they recommended a more modern song of the time. Instead of the title Beetlejuice, they want something simpler like Ghost House and the apparently anonymous haunted house story 39480. Doesn't get simpler than that. Burton at one point even threw up his hands and said, why don't you just call it Scared Sheetless? And the studio actually considered it. To his credit though, they did let Burton have the final word. And it really is his unique vision as a director and the charm of these actors that make this movie work. One of my favorite things at the time this movie came out was everyone's reactions to Adam and Barb, played by Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis. Everyone seemed to weirdly love or hate these characters. Baldwin himself was annoyed at the lack of complexity they had, and some critics said they were too boring to be the leads. But not only are they clearly supposed to be the straight men of the film, but they're really likable straight men. They're simple, they're happy, you can tell they lived a nice life together, and you feel their chemistry. It's a great contrast to everything that comes up later, like they took a vacation to get away from the complications and bureaucracy of life, only to find the afterlife is nothing but complications and bureaucracy. Roger Ebert actually gave this a negative review because he thought they were too likable and wanted to see a film just about them. I like that relationship between Gina Davis and Alec Baldwin. I yeah. thought it was going to be a goofy, silly comedy about this young married couple right. trying to fix up this crummy house. So it's pretty funny for all the strange imagery in this film. The one major split everybody had was on arguably the safest characters in the flick. Naturally, a traveling circus of character actors make up the rest of the cast, as they should. Catherine O'Hara, Jeffrey Jones, Glenn Shaddix, and Winona Ryder had all dabbled in comedy before and worked very naturally as an unnatural family. There's even totally random casting like Dick Cabot and Robert Goulet. 
who are fine, but not in the movie long enough to justify them being there. Maybe the studio recommended them too, I don't know. You are a flake. You have always been a flake. If you insist on frightening people, do it with your sculpture. All the characters in the afterlife, of course, give performances as big as the effects they're covered in. Thanks, I've been feeling a little flat. <laughs> Even side characters who get little to no screen time do a great job. Look at this lady trying to sell the house. I don't even know if her performance added up amounts to two minutes, but she creates a fully fleshed out character in that mere two minutes she has. What happened to the people who used to live here? They drowned. Yes, they were family. I was devastated. Here. But as you'd expect, the big scene stealer is Michael Keaton in the main role. I've seen The Exorcist about 167 times, and it keeps getting funnier every single time I see it! When I was a kid, I could not believe this was the same guy who played Batman. I've obviously seen him in many roles since and noticed how versatile he was, but back then, my eight-year-old mind could not comprehend this was the same person. Turn around and look behind you! Hi, how are you? <laughs> This is another performance that easily could have backfired. A good example of this is Howie Mandel in one of the film's clones, Little Monsters. Boo. <laughs> He's clearly giving it his all to try and make the material work, but it just isn't there. So it comes across as dedicated, but awkward. Here, you can tell the actors worked hard to get the timing down of these well-written jokes, because so much of what makes them work is the speed and spontaneity of it. You didn't have to, but you picked me. It makes me want to kiss you guys. Come on, come no. on. Give me one. Ah, give me one. Ah. I love how to win them over, Keaton is wearing Baldwin's clothes in between cuts just so he can say, We even shop at the same store. You'd easily miss that edit because they're throwing so much at you. My two favorite scenes are, of course, the scary face gag. Can you be scary? What do you think of this? <laughs> you like it? Which was originally a backup joke in Pee Wee if it turned out they couldn't get the large Marge effect right. And also the throwing voice joke. Possession, good. Learn to throw your voice, fool your friends, fun and party. <gasps> I love this one because most directors would do a close up of Davis's face talking with Keaton's voice so you wouldn't miss it. But Burton lets your eye wander to figure out the voice is coming from her. You see, Keaton isn't talking, so naturally you go to Baldwin. You see, he isn't talking, so then on a lark, you go to Davis, who's finishing up saying her line just as you realize what's going on. It's only a three second joke, but it's staged perfectly among all the other fast paced humor here. By the way, fun fact, this is the first time I ever heard the F word. Again, in a PG film at a time when PG actually meant you should have parental guidance. Nice fucking model! My grandma was visiting just after I watched this scene and you guessed it, I greeted her by quoting that line and mimicking that action. All I can say is, I did not repeat that line or reenact that action ever again. In fact, I'm supposed to punish myself if I even mention it. I'll see you in a few minutes, I have a corner to be in. Hello, I'm Doug Walker. I have something very exciting to tell you. You see, a long time Hello, ago- Hello, I'm Doug Walker from the future. What Doug Walker has to say is very important, but not as important as stamps. If you're a small business owner, you know how important it is to be prepared for the holiday season. If you haven't started preparing for the chaos of holiday mailing and shipping, you're already falling behind. Luckily, Stamps.com has everything you need to make your life a whole lot easier. It's the 24-7 post office that you can access anywhere. No lines, no traffic, no hassle. Stamps.com is your one-stop shop for all shipping and mailing needs. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Get access to USPS and UPS services you need to run your business right now from your computer. Because let's face it, with inflation on the rise, every dollar counts. Protect your margins with major discounts on USPS and UPS rates up to 86% off. This is a stress-free solution for any small business. Use stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and printer. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your stamps.com dashboard. Rates are constantly changing. With stamps.com's switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates, so you know you're getting the best deal every time. And if you're running an online store, stamps.com works seamlessly with all your major shopping carts and marketplaces. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with Stamps.com today. 
Sign up at stamps.com slash nostalgia for a special offer that includes a four-week free trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash nostalgia. Okay, now we got that out of the way, I'll let him continue with his important- Okay, he kind of got halfway through there. Uh, I guess I'll pick up where he left off. So, the really important thing that really you should know is that as soon as this Hello, thing- Hello, I'm Walker from another future, and what he has to say is incredibly important, but not as important as Chime. Is the piece of plastic in your wallet doing enough for you? Because with a secure Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start building credit with everyday purchases and on-time payments. That's the magic of Credit Builder. You can increase your credit history with no annual fees or interest. And having a higher credit score can mean getting better car loan rates or renting apartments easier. Or just bragging rights around the dinner table. So continue your credit journey with Chime. Sign up only takes two minutes and it doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at Chime.com slash nostalgia. That's Chime.com slash nostalgia. Oh boy, here's that guy who talks really fast. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stripe Bank NA. Pursuant to a license from Visa USA, Chime checking accounts and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secure Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact score may vary, and some users' scores may not improve. Okay, so now we should definitely let them get back to their important thing again. It looks like they're kind of wrapping up there. Uh, so I'll just give you a real quick sum up here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Doug Walker from the future. I discovered time travel! What?! Doug returns to playing Kingdom Hearts in Birth by Sleep every Friday on Twitch. We also have new content six days a week. Hope to see you there. One of the hot things right now in movies, shows, games, books, really any entertainment, is world building. The world building in Beetlejuice is both some of the best and some of the worst you'll ever see. It's some of the best because the world has a very defined look and virtually anything can happen in it. There is definitely a consistency to its look and oddness. It's some of the worst because the rules aren't very well defined. Which, don't get me wrong, is part of the joke. They're just given a handbook that, as they say, reads like bad stereo instructions. Geographical and temporal perimeters. Functional perimeters vary from manifestation to manifestation. So the film does have that leeway that doesn't need to explain everything. But even the rules that are explained are inconsistent. Everybody always looks the way they died, but if so, why aren't Adam and Barbara always dripping wet? Apparently they were gonna do this, but they realized it would be too annoying and even distracting to keep up. They know they can't be seen, yet they never think to move something around like poltergeist to scare the people away. And even within the rules of the world, it's not clear how they can force people to dance and sing, or how they make shrimp cocktails come to life. I guess since the shrimp are dead, they have powers too? Shit, where do shrimp go when they die in this universe? It's made clear very early on, though, that's not how this film is supposed to work. It's like asking where Edward Scissorhands got the giant blocks of ice. How can a shrunken building not be destroyed with all that shaking in Ant-Man? Why doesn't Gandalf use his staff against the Nazguls all the time? This is where the genre of these films come into play. It's here to enhance the ideas of these worlds, not the details. Edward Scissorhands is a fairy tale. Ant-Man is a superhero story. Lord of the Rings is a fantasy. And this is a supernatural comedy. There's definitely subgenres in all these where maybe they would explain more of the details, but in the context of the worlds they created and what they're trying to do, it works. Burton even said he wanted the effects in this movie to look a little cheap. He knew the world was not meant to be taken too seriously, and he wanted the effects to reflect that, showing it operates more on a B-movie level. The funny thing is, though, while a lot of them are cheap looking, a lot of them are also pretty phenomenal. <laughs> You know these are puppets and makeup and stop motion, but you also know they're really there. They're actually interacting off of a lot of these things. I think a lot of us have had CGI fatigue for some time. Now we can see a skeleton shark jump into mid-air and we feel nothing. I still feel something when I see these effects. Because they were something solid that was handmade. It's because it's only one filter of illusion, making the solid thing in front of you feel alive. CG is two filters, making the thing in front of you feel alive and like it's really there. So there's a bit more of a disconnect. Even that scary snake is half stop motion and half puppet, and it's hard to tell which is which half the time. 
I even talked with the woman who did the effects on this thing, and she revealed this lake shot was actually a ham puppet and a little girl doubling as Catherine O'Hara. That's really inventive, and in my opinion, looks a lot more believable than if it was done with CG. It also scared the everlasting butt juice out of me when I was a kid, the way it strangely moved and interacted with everyone. Again, I don't think CG would have done that as effectively. With that said, is this a movie for kids? I know I wanted to see it bad when I was a kid, and like I said, I did, and I'm still being punished for it. I'd be lying though if I said it didn't seriously creep me out. But like I also said before, I loved that as a kid. If this movie was released today, it'd probably get a PG-13. Rotten Tomatoes even had an article declaring it a family-friendly feature. I'll admit, I do chuckle thinking of all the families showing their kids this PG family-friendly feature thinking it's gonna be something like Frozen and instead getting... <laughs> so do I personally recommend it for kids? Not really, unless you're all aware what you're getting yourselves into. Like I said, I loved this stuff when I was younger and the visuals clearly have a cartoony mentality. The humor also had a very kindergartner mindset half the time. I even had the toys. Yeah, there were kids' toys at a time when, well, a lot of clearly not kids' movies had kids' toys. So while I personally don't see it as a kids' film, I can see why kids are drawn to it. Beetlejuice was a major success and even got Burton the job of directing Batman, as Warner Brothers wanted to see how he'd do on a smaller dark project before giving him a bigger dark project. This was arguably the first time we saw a traditional Tim Burton film, utilizing his more common visuals, themes, and even actors. He would reuse a lot of these people in the future, even picking Keaton as Batman when all the fans were against it. There's always talk of a Beetlejuice 2 in the future, and honestly, I don't need to see that. Keaton's still amazing, but I'm barely buying him wearing the bat suit at his age, so the idea of him under all that makeup just doesn't sound right. I'm totally down for Beetlejuice spin-offs, though. Because there have been two pretty successful ones. The cartoon show, again aimed at kids, had a pretty decent run. It did change enough to be its own thing. Beetlejuice and Lydia are now friends instead of a grown man trying to marry a child. Somehow that makes that worse. But it was imaginative, still had an edge, and true, made no sense whatsoever, but in fairness, the movie barely made any sense. There's also a successful Broadway musical that's gaining more and more fans. And once again, is inspired by the movie, but is not just doing the same thing all over again. Maybe that's one of the upsides of having a world that's so open, yet still so vague. It does give you a chance to expand and add different outlooks to it. There's some themes and ideas you should stick to, like still being about the dead and having a dark but goofy feel. But outside of that, you can kind of do whatever you want. You could do a spin-off about Juno as a caseworker, the world of Saturn and the Sandworms. Honestly, any of these characters could have a fun, original movie written around their afterlife. And I think that's why people gravitate towards it so much. Yes, it's silly, juvenile, and doesn't always add up, but it's also imaginative, energetic, and presents a lot of possibilities. It's one of those few mainstream but weird movies everybody got on board for. It didn't have to grow a cult following over time, it achieved it right away. And even years later, people are still trying to duplicate that same feel. It is a film, though, that seemed to come out at just the right time when everybody wanted something odd and imaginative, but you didn't have to think too hard about. It's a film your average moviegoer can look at and say, yeah, I like weird things sometimes. But also die-hard weirdos like myself can enjoy for its spontaneity and unique visuals. It's not often a film this strange grabs everyone, but when you see other movies that were fads for a while, I'm definitely glad this is one that people gave a spotlight to. I'm a nostalgia critic, guy, remember? So you don't have to. We're continuing cameos for charity, and all this month, we're donating to the Naperville Humane Society. Why this one in particular? Because it's where my brother Rob got his pet dog, Ellie. And she's pretty adorable. This is a non-profit, limited-admission animal shelter for dog and cat adoption, foster care, and owner surrenders. Their mission is to promote the humane treatment of compassion animals and create lasting human-animal bonds. 
They seek to deliver services to their community that reflect their integrity, respect, compassion, and joy for all people and animals. So if you want a cameo for me saying hi or happy birthday or whatever, click the link below and be giving to a wonderful organization. If you like to hell with that noise, I don't want a cameo from you, well consider looking at this great organization anyway. Like I said, it does a lot of good and there's some really great animals you can help out. Check them out and see all the adorableness you've been missing out on.